couple things. First off, you had Uncle Tom's Cabin Dew. Uncle Tom's Cabin, please make that out. And that was, you have to do the three different things. Who does that look like? There will be a quiz tomorrow. I just about finished it, then I got preoccupied. Yes. Just, just note it on the box. I was going to tag them all into the grade book, but seventh period yesterday, I got to watch Mr. Parsons class. He was skipping. No, he had to go someplace, so I wasn't able to do it, but I'm going to do it today, seventh period. No, I thought I had way too many. This is a labor union. You want to do the one for 1880? You want to jump up? Okay, any questions about Uncle Tom? And Uncle Tom was a great hero. Uh, remember that term because we'll come back to it. Okay, the historical context should be pretty easy, right? Now we've done that. So it's good to review. And what was Stowe's purpose when she wrote this? Go ahead. Say it again. Yeah, how dehumanizing and awful. Talks about the punishment. Talk, and doesn't really hold anything back here. Even though she had never been there, she had read a couple, she'd read a lot about it, talked to a few people that run away, and so she kind of combined this all. And what's her point of view? She's a what? Yeah, she's an abolitionist. She has a political goal to end slavery. She's very pragmatic about it. She wasn't quite a purist, but hope this is a good one. And turn them up. Make sure your name is on it. <laughs> You're bad. How dare you? Oh, no, you brought me a problem. You're good. So anything you want to know. On the... Uncle Tom's cabin, just get it to me. Uh, will you hear them off? I'm not I don't want to know that. Just, just, as soon as you can't get it, just remind me that you weren't here. Uh, not a big deal. Just get it. And just do the same three things for that. Quick brainstorm. You just to kind of. Yeah. Same thing. Same thing. Just remind me, I won't mark it last. Now, a couple things in. First thing. As long as you can do this after reading a document, it'll make the document easier to read. And as we get a little more historical context, all this will get easier and easier. So easy, in fact, this is what we call the DB3. Now, I'm only giving you the documents for now. We're not writing the essay right now. But I want you to look at it. In fact, that would be a good thing to do over Thanksgiving break. In fact, that would be a good thing to do at the know. Pretty much all week. Yeah. So are we going to actually end up writing the essay? We will. But when I have time to go through the documents, I'm going to answer any questions when we get back on Monday. Then we'll talk about writing the DBQ. But the big thing is a document-based question, a DBQ, is an essay question. You're still writing your thesis. You are still making your argument, taking a strong position, writing a blueprint. You're still going to use your outside information. You're still going to organize it your way. But you're also going to use documents or information from the documents. Poor God, yeah. Your information from the documents as evidence to prove your thesis. And you have to use either examples of historical content around. We have one extra in this row. Just keep passing them over, yeah. Hold, hold that one. Okay, for sure. Either historical content from the era of the document. The purpose of the document, you know, the basic, the reason why they're doing it, or the point of view of the author as evidence to prove your thesis. Now, that's what we're doing this weekend. But, see this up here? When I had all these made up, I made this. I 
make, I, I got a couple different DBQs, I got my documents, I tried to really organize this well, and wrote it up. And the document-based questions, I think they're good questions, but I also try to um, do the same thing the college board does for the AP exam to help you prepare. Well, I think I mentioned this before, but they changed the PDQ again. Fifth year in a row. And so this is now obsolete. So you can cross out these directions. I'll give you the overall directions on Monday. I got a whole thing we'll talk about. But it doesn't change the basic element of the document, how to use the documents. Your essay question, a very basic one for this first one. Analyze the factors that led to secession and so on. And so what I want you to do is this. Read the eight documents. And what's the first thing you do when you read the document? Title, author. Title, author, date. Yeah, get that basic information. You can probably guess a lot to me around 1860. So clearly it's stuff we're coming up to. Now, you don't have to do all three historical content, purpose, or point of view. But pick one of the three that you think would best or could best be used as evidence to prove the uh, factors that led to civil war. Yes. What does it mean? Three? Yeah, one of three. Read what shopping. Are they? What are they? You remember the story, like just like we did Broco Pong's cap. So either historical content around it that we shape that, the purpose of the document, which is usually probably the best one. I'm just telling you, you can always write this is what they meant. Or the point of view. What about the internet audience? Hmm? The internet audience. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that on Monday. But intended audience, in reality, that rolls into purpose. And so I want to simplify and just make you think about those. But I was going to bring up more about the audience. And use, because you remember that from AP Euro. And what I want you to do is this. For each one, and there's a space underneath, just write it down. Just a phrase to talk about how you would do the purpose of each document. So the first one, the Republican Party platform. You've already read a little bit about it, you'll read more, we'll talk about it probably tomorrow too. But a good idea where they're going. That's pretty free soil. If you read that first thing. Now you know some of the documents are gonna be really short. Document five is excerpts from George Templeton's Strong Sky. A little bit longer, but it's actually a pretty easy one to read. And then you'll notice one of them is a map. And the map is the election of 1860, showed the popular vote and the electoral college. And for that one, it's kind of hard to tell the point of view of a map. You can do a little bit, but the big thing is the purpose, or what's going on around, the historical events that led to Lincoln's victory. I mean, to give you one, for example, Lincoln wasn't even on the ballot of any southern states. And yet he got, and he only got, he got less than 40% of the popular vote, but remember, that's not what matters, it's the Electoral College. You know, this really shows the sectional divide. You can really see it. And also the fact that there are four presidential candidates. What a year. So that's all I want, and then on Monday we'll talk about sort of setting up the DBQ, and we'll do it in class. My whole goal is when coming to write this first DBQ, you're going to feel really confident and good about it. I know where you're going to go. Know what information you're going to use, and then how we'll use the documents. I'll give you examples on that day, on Monday, and we can write it. Sound fun? They're actually pretty good essays. The problem is you have to get those documents in. I sympathize for that. But the documents will help you. These are very good documents. Actually, I really try to think of a kind of a secessionist point of view. The U.S. point of view, the northern point of view, yeah. So what do you write on the one? Basically, choose one of the historical context, purpose, or point of view. Oh, okay. For which one of those of these documents you think, okay, you know, the purpose will work best for my answer. That's that Sound good? I'll be Monday. Yeah. 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 Would you like a little bit more? Yes. The last page of those documents, or the documents I gave you, Uncle Tom's Cabin and all that. The last page, so remember Uncle Tom's Cabin, the positive good theory? It's a map. Please do the map. You have Uncle Tom, you have the one with Uncle Tom's Cabin, that map will be do on the Monday when you get there. Okay, so real quick. And what, a lot of you probably get, hopefully you get without using an atlas. The maps are in your book, but they're, they have um, 
1862, 1863 divided by years, and I will help you for once you can't find. But it's in your the map, there are about six maps here. Mm -hmm. Oh, the, remember they're electoral votes. And so what happened is some of the electors voted for Johnson and some elect or, or Douglas and some voted for Lincoln. That doesn't happen very often now, but it happened a lot. 1960, after Harry Bird and his civil rights. And one more thing. I'm giving you most of chapter 14. I've already assigned that. And we're going to have a quiz tomorrow on chapter 14. But there's about the last little bit, 626 to 637, it's basically the election. So you have to read that. Sound good? 637. All righty then. And then think about the documents. Please read them. Think in context of the question. And you're not going to summarize the documents. But you're going to show how the documents can be used as evidence, as arguments to prove your thesis. You can talk about you know, southern entrenchments or northern uh, fear of the spread of slavery, things such as that. Any questions? Are you excited? So, Are you sad that we got four days, five days off? Monday, all the stuff. Yep. Are we test testing that week too? Yes. Yeah, there'll be. Um, well, we're at DBQ, which will be in many ways like a test, but, so, um, but we'll do that probably on Tuesday, uh, Tuesday or Wednesday. Do we have like a multiple choice? I'm sure need to test with some. We're gonna have one pretty soon. That just probably, maybe not next week because of the DBQ. It will take us so much time. <laughs> All right, then let's go and finish up. Uh, we got Matt Turner, didn't we? Did we get to Nat Turner? Yeah. Looks like Nat Turner. Pretty horrific rebellion. Where was the rebellion where they beheaded the the slaves and put them on on pikes to show you know, don't this is what happened to rebels? Yeah, the New Orleans, and that was probably the bloodiest, the bloodiest American slave rebellion. But Nat Turner's got a bigger effect. What was the worst part about slavery? I mean, it's all horrific. But when slaves look back, what do they remember thinking? That's this is the worst. <laughs> You remember that from Friday? I know it's a long time ago. Yes. Oh. Yeah. That's why I show you being sold. Because you couldn't control your own life. Families would be broken up. And what was the most common form of resistance? You know, rebellions and numbers didn't work well for slaves. What's that? Break. Yeah, break stuff. That passive resistance. Act like you're, you've accepted your position and act like a slave is supposed to. They turn around and do something. What they call those people who were... Sambo was um, and coffee, yeah. And other words for that. Do we do we just mention this in the bell ring? Do we talk about it at all? We did for we did did we do Denmark Vesey? Yeah. Oh we did we did talk about he killed uh, over fifty whites and butchered them. And who told on him? Yeah, remember that kind of racism within? And what we're going to come out of this, this just terrified the South. Few events had a bigger impact on the South than that turn. That's what would be John Brown's right in 1859. The, the impact would go on for years because they blamed Nat Turner on, because he was educated, he was reading anti-slavery slavery pamphlets. So they incited the rebellion. Northerners, remember that's part of the reason why they were so scared about Texas becoming their protectorate of Britain. That fear that somehow they'll be from without, from outside, will come in and trigger this slave rebellion. And this is going to lead to a series of slave codes that every southern state will adopt in some way that they just simply call the Nat Turner laws. And intense, intensify the slave codes. And one of the biggies are slave tags. Every black person in the South had to have a, have, a, have a tag to show they were either who owned them, field worker. This is just horrific. And the name of this field hand was called Biscuit. The, just, and then the whole, you can read it, it's just awful. If, 
somebody was black and in the South who didn't have this tag, they would be imprisoned and sold into slavery, even if they were free. Remember I told you how slavery and republics don't go well together? You'd be enslaved for not wearing an identification tag? It really, they put more restrictions on the education of slaves, even though about 20% of slaves could read, write, do math, but they restricted it. Also, no more, almost every state adopted a law, rule that said no more than four slaves could ever meet together, except in church. That's why those rituals were such a big deal. Strengthened the militia, censored the mail to keep out anti-slavery material, and now that, that's when you get that gag rule to say no talk about slavery in the Senate and the House. And the reason I mention this is because all these things kind of happened after Nat Turner. And so yeah, it was Calhoun's idea to protect slavery, the gag rule, but one more thing. This is 1831, Nat Turner's insurrection. 1832 is the beginning of the nullification crisis. It's no coincidence that you have that big push to protect slavery after that term. Yeah. They begin to strengthen the militias. The realization that you know slave rebellion is even a bigger threat. And you'll see the same thing after John Brown, right? Time for Civil War. This is the marker that they're, they may kind of make it seem like uh, not quite as big of an event. This is a big deal. And this is 1831. It's no coincidence that this is the real beginning. 1831 is seen as the beginning of the abolitionist movement in the North. Yes, there was an anti-slavery movement before, but William Lord Garrison would start his newspaper, The Liberator, in 1831. There's Garrison after that's 1860s, but and he'd be one of the most famous ones. And he believed that slavery was completely immoral. There's no, therefore, those who had slaves were immoral. And he even brushed, he was quite the radical, about equality. Thought that free slaves might be equal. Most abolitionists did not believe that. Frederick Douglass would be another one of the more famous abolitionists. We mentioned it before. Douglass, who stole himself from slavery. That's what he liked to say, I stole my body. He read his autobiography, used the proceeds to buy his freedom. He would start his own anti-slavery newspaper, which I think is a great name, the North Star. Why North Star? You're going north. Get the freedom. It'd be the symbol of freedom. And tireless fighter for equal rights. He was a little more pragmatic than Garrison, but they both were at Seneca Falls. What was Seneca Falls again? And if you're going to end slavery on the plantations and in the South, what about slavery in the home? They weren't hypocritical in that way at all. And he would fight, one of his big pushes during the war was for black soldiers to be enlisted at the fight to prove they deserve citizenship as anybody else. And to be a tireless fighter for civil rights afterwards, we're not done with Douglas. And, but there's a big divide. So many abolitionists, they look at slavery as hurting the white republic, hurting white people. It was hurting the soul of them. And so they were actually thinking in terms of how do we make this white republic? And there were anti-slavery peers like the Tappan brothers. Here are the Tappan brothers. Uh, and Louis Tappan on the right, probably the most famous. The Grimke sisters, they, uh, they were from South Carolina. They went to Philadelphia, became Quakers, start the um, became very prominent both as abolitionists and feminists. And how many abolitionists lived in the South? If you spoke out against slavery, there you could be lynched in the South. But they were pretty purist towards ending slavery. There were a lot of abolitionists who were more pragmatic, who looked at a more gradual response. Harry Beecher Stowe is a classic example of that, but other ones. And, but the big divide, when it comes right down to it, most, including all of them, wanted to end slavery, but they didn't necessarily believe that the freedmen should get equal rights. I should add this so I don't forget. What a her terrible hatchet job on these pictures. Do you see what they did? They had two portraits, they cut the face out, and put them on paintings of 
of women in dresses. So you notice how the faces don't, they're, they're too big and they look flat, <laughs> uh, two-dimensional, like they have no back of their head. Yeah, hey, that's just really horrible job they did on that. But only about 10% of the population of North were abolitionists by the Civil War, and that might be overstating it. Most Northerners, people like Abraham Lincoln, didn't like slavery, would like to have gone someday, but they were free soldiers. These people were actually pretty much hated in the North, and to show how it was pretty racist, they didn't care so much about what happened to the slaves, but how it's hurting them, slavery, could be seen in the American Colonization Society. Started in 1820, and so many people were involved in this, but the idea was, they'll take slaves, buy their freedom, or take slaves out of fugitives, or free in the North, and this would have to be money for it, and send them to, well, this picture's not in the United States, where is it? Well, they're from Africa, so they'll just send them to Africa. What country would they create? On the western coast of Africa. Liberia. Actually, there's going to be a Maryland, too. But that never turned out. Now it's part of Ivory Coast now. But Liberia, yeah. They're going to free slaves, like buy their freedom, or take free men and women, and pay for them to go to Africa. Now they thought is we'll send them back home so we can have this white republic here in the United States. But this was so patently ridiculous, it's hard to even wrap your mind around. I mean, think about by 1860, there are four million slaves. How are you gonna send four million people? It's not even comprehensible. You know, all the years of the slave trade for the United States, there was 500,000, we're talking almost 100 years. And not only that, most of the slaves were fourth, fifth, sixth generation Americans. They were born in the United States, their parents were, their grandparents were. They probably didn't even know exactly what part of Africa they came from because of the nature of the slave trade. And we're just gonna drop them off here? I mean, it's like saying people of European or Asian descent, we're just gonna drop you someplace in the big Eurasian colony and say, there, you're back. Good luck. Found some cheap land in Mongolia, so there you are. <laughs> I mean, think about that for a second. And they basically set up a tiered system. When they started arriving in Liberia, and by the way, they named the capital Monrovia after President Monroe, still the capital of Liberia today. And the people from the United States, they became like the aristocracy of this new country. And the Africans who lived there became virtual slaves to them, which is ironic, isn't it? And Liberia's gonna have this kind of two-tiered caste system that will blow up in the 1970s, and they've gone through about 40 years of civil war. It was hell on earth in the late 80s, 90s, involving child soldiers and massacres. It was unreal. Hell, that's connected with that, by the way. It's amazing how things happen. A refugee from that fight to get away from the hell there immigrated to Helena, who is now the mayor of Helena. Pretty amazing, a refugee from that, which all started from this. And Abraham Lincoln thought this was the right idea. Many others did too. And that should give you an idea about the abolitionists. And the reason I'm saying this is Southerners thought the abolitionists were the most radical people. It turned out they were very bitterly divided and a minority in the North in reality. And so we've done slavery, industrial revolution, manifest destiny, all of these events. It's time, people. The fiery 50s. Wait, wait. Cool, huh? You don't seem to be as impressed as I thought you would be. I, I believe in this for Ken Spirit. Thank you. Man, the other classes, I knew they wouldn't get it, but I thought you guys would get it. Who's that? Yes. That's Sean Brown. And John Brown will become one of the most important and divisive characters of this era. Another abolitionist who believed that all people should be equal. After the war, he'd be called a zealot and everything else. He's an interesting man. We'll come back to him. And so let's get, no, you have to write this down. This is just review. Remember the Wilmot Proviso? 
no slavery in the Mets concession. They voted on this time after time. So the election of 1848, we have a concert. <laughs> and <laughs> Huh? That's Green Day. Yeah. You know, um, they did uh, Longview, uh, 10,000 years from here now, and he gave them a guitar. Yeah. There was some, there was some 15 year old who came up and played. Was it like a three chord? That was me. Longview, like three chords. That one I think they just sang. It was another song. Uh, was a thousand years from now, an older song they did, but they played it. Wasn't that one? Somebody likes Green Day. I do too. They did that one in the uncle. But um, election of 1848, he brought three people, some like, little kid. Did they make a band? They didn't do that. Oh. But they brought some 15 year old and played guitar and they gave him a guitar. That'd be pretty cool to get a guitar, I'd say. Okay, we already know this. This is a review, right? Who was elected president in this? Or up and ready. But what was the idea to let the people, the territories vote? And that's cats, the Democratic Party, and free soil. But here's the deal. Harris, or sorry, Zachary Taylor, Miller Fillmore's vice president. We had no idea. We, because I was a little kid then. Had no idea what Taylor really wanted, but gold. Once gold was covered, we are this once again reviewed. So it's blowing up the whole thing about slavery. Those plaster minings, I love this picture. It's from 1850 of hydraulic mining. Using water. Pretty effective way to mine. The flutes are horrific from that. Because it washes out into the water supply so much faster. All the arsenic and fun things you get from mining. Mercury. Mercury is fun. And the Mexican session. So this is where we quit after that. And California, after the gold rush began, wanted to be a free state. And that's the issue. Zachary Taylor had no idea what he wanted to do. But shocking everybody, he actually, the slaveholder from Louisiana and frontier soldier, would be befriended by a abolitionist ways named Charles Sumner. We'll get to Sumner a little bit later on, so don't worry about that name right now. Kind of shocked everybody. And Taylor's idea was this. So, want to see Taylor? I know you do. So let's look at him. Or Taylor. Remember the bubble, the glass? But Taylor remembers the big problem: slavery in the territories. That's the problem that's so divisive. What if we just skip that? And make them states right now. Then everybody will be happy, right? If slavery in the territories is the issue, let's just say one big state of California and one really big state of New Mexico. That would have enough population, two states. Problem solved. But what about slavery? Because they would come in with their existing laws and customs. Meaning what about slavery? No. no slavery. Two massive free states. And that's Taylor's plan. And Taylor assumed I solved the problem. No civil war, problem solved. I'm going to go down in history as one of the greatest presidents ever. Who do you suppose looked at that and was not quite happy? Think about Southerners. And we have new Southerners, a new bunch of Southern senators and congressmen who. They were, they were born or grew up after the Industrial Revolution, after the Missouri Compromise, after the nullification crisis. They weren't looking at this country just barely holding together. Now they see it something totally different, as the South is being pinched down, threatening with slave rebellion. We cannot allow this. And they had the appropriate name, because of their desire to be radicals, the Fire Eaters. Now, think about fire. That means they're the most radical. And they're going to say it must all be open to slavery. The whole thing. Slave codes from Texas to the coast. And Edmund Ruffin of Virginia, he would actually, he's, he would take credit for firing the first shot in the Civil War. Edmund Ruffin. 
And William Yancey of Alabama was a plantation owner, but radicalized to the point we must fight slavery or we're going to have to go to war. Mason was a little more pragmatic with the same idea. Their whole goal is we have to spread slavery out because we don't spread it out. You're condemning us to slave rebellion. You're destroying the southern way of life. And so they immediately start talking secession. Immediately. We are going to secede from the Union. And here's the thing. Secession equals civil war. The country cannot survive secession. Because if the country allows one state to leave, the next crisis, more states will leave. It's done. It will break apart into many different countries that could be picked apart by the British or whatever might happen. And so they're threatening the end of the country to promote slavery. And don't forget, they don't see it so much as spreading slave states to the coast. They see it as protecting their system in Alabama, or South Carolina, or Virginia. And first period said they look like a boy band. Third and fourth period think more of a heavy metal band. What do you think? He, of course, he's the front man, right? You're talking, yeah. right? You can see that, right? Yeah. And then I, drummer. Yeah. Think about all these guys. They all stay in the same boarding house because there was really no place to live during the during the five months that Congress meet back then. And so think about it. you're all you're with a bunch of people who all agree, and you're all like, ah, oh, let's get them. What do you think every dinner was like? You know. <laughs> just getting yourself all fired up. Yes, we all agree. And so they just got more and more radicalized. Yeah, lots of yelling. They're fire eaters. One more thing I should add. A lot of people thought, let's do the Missouri Compromise line to the sea. But the fire eaters, no, that's not enough. And free soilers, that's too much. And so 3630, they kept saying, let's just bring that line. They'll do it again in 1860 and 61 before the Civil War. But 3630 isn't going to work. Now, who was known as the Great Compromise? Broke up the Missouri Compromise into two bills. You have Clay. That compromise tariff during the nullification crisis. He's getting old. He realizes he'll never be president. This might be my last chance. And he would propose one bill that we call, would eventually call the Compromise of 1850. Now, this is one of the last pictures of Clay taken. You can see all the scratches on the glass negative, and look at the smile. He just had the, like he knows something. Now, Taylor is going to dub this bill that he's totally opposed to. He's going to call it the Omnibus Bill. Omnibus means all-encompassing bill. The bill is going to cover all the problems, not just California, New Mexico, but other problems. Uh, back when Congress used to function in the United States, and I wish I was being facetious, they would pass a bill for like all the budgets, like, you know, the budget for defense and interior, all the different, depart different departments, and they call that an omnibus bill. So that's all me, just all encompassing. But so originally, everyone called it the omnibus bill. And Clay's plan was everything at once, solve it all. Now, I'm going to give you the four main parts, and then one part, it's going to be, it'll change. Now, I've asked this, but let me show you what it's going to be. California free. What section? What's this? This is a compromise. What section? And another northern thing. They wanted to abolish slavery in D.C., to get rid of the scourge of slavery right in the shadow of the United States Capitol. But you can imagine how Southerners felt about that. If slavery is legal, why should we abolish it in the Capitol? A Southern Capitol, which DC is. But you know the asterisk? That will change. That one's going to change. This one would. New Mexico and Utah talk to off. But this was a scam, and everybody knew it. Clay implied that these two big territories, so basically splitting New Mexico in half, they would decide their own constitutions right away. But that meant free. Southerners were furious. But if they wait five years, that's going to allow people to bring in their slaves. If you bring in your slaves, you need slave codes, and you've essentially opened it to slavery. Popular sovereignty, it all depends when the vote is. 
It's a scam. Southerners didn't trust this, but they wanted it. Next, slaves were running away to the north and weren't being held. That's the North Star. They wanted a tough fugitive slave law. Basically, the Constitution says you must return property, and so this is going to force states to return runaway slaves and make all adult citizens assist in running down runaway slaves. So let's say we lived in Boston, and the story came that there was a fugitive slave nearby. Every one of you young men must join a posse to run down the slave. And if you don't join the posse, you will go to jail. So all of you will join. Doesn't matter your views. You have to run down whomever they say is the runaway slave. And by the way, what does a fugitive slave look like? Every other, every other slave. Every other, not every other black person. So couldn't they just kidnap somebody? Uncle Todd's Cabin was one of the most popular anti-slavery books, but the other one of the 1850s was a book called 12 Years a Slave, which they just made a movie about three years ago. Is that yes. something about right? Yeah. And it was about a man who was kidnapped and into, into slavery, and then wrote his autobiography after he, after he ran away. And so what the deal is, is that that happened all the time. But if you don't like it, you still got to join or you go to jail. We'll come back to this. Northerners will be furious. Next, Texas border was all confusing. And Texas, back when it was a republic, had all these debts. What they thought is, Texas will give up some land and we'll forgive their debts. But, Clay suggested this line across. See where my hand is? That would be Texas. The rest of it will be open up to free states. So Southerners were furious. And he wanted this whole thing passed as one bill. And people said, no, you got to break it up. Northerners will never vote for a law with this, and Southerners will never vote for this. And there's other parts nobody likes. Clay, this time, refused to break it up. And the bill went nowhere. In fact, in May of 1850, Clay went home thinking it's over. He had failed, and the country he saw rise to power will fall. It's done. Soon there'll be fistfights on the floor of the United States Congress. People started bringing guns and knives, and they would open their coat and flash people giving speeches. People would come into the gallery, shout down other people speaking. These are not members of Congress. They just come and start yelling them down, yelling down. I mean, this, the whole thing was falling apart. And Clay was right about one thing. He didn't have much more time. Within a year, that's his death mask. Before photography, how do you remember someone? It's hard to remember. It goes away. So they would do a plaster mask of their face so they would have their face. Yeah. So 1851, mm -hmm. By the way, look at the face. Look at the smile. Just like the picture, right? He had that grin. That must have been just the way, the natural shape of his face. Or they kind of went, <laughs> So, yeah. Was it like a strategy to him to keep all of the bills in one? Yeah, he thought we all must make a, a loot, or we all must give up something. But he forgot how back in 1820, he broke up that bill to get the Missouri Compromise passed. It's like he forgot he became very pigheaded. Daniel Webster, another giant of this era, would give his last speech in support of the Compromise of 1850. Yes, he was like an angry owl there. And what he said was, we got to stop sectionalism. We're Americans. And that's the great beginning. Yes, he's from Massachusetts. Yes, he's from the North. But he's an American. But a lot of Northerners didn't listen. You don't need to write down the idea of the speech. I'm just showing that Daniel Webster came out for it. And Webster, same deal. It's almost like this desperation of that class of politicians who all took office in the, in the teens of the 19th century. Because a little over a year, his death mask, meaning he died, I guess I should add that. <laughs> and then 
one more member of the Senate who was so ill, he had to be carried in on a stretcher, tied to the stretcher, and they propped it up while James Mason actually read the speech. Who's this? Hmm? What? You're ready for what? I won't do that. John. <laughs> Got it! John! See? Yeah, let's relax. I don't know. But look at the finger. Look at the finger. It's like the finger is like six joints. It's six jointed. Contemplate that. In Calhoun's speech, which he could not read, wanted two presidents. And the two presidents, one for the north and one for the south, each with a veto. So they could stop Southern or anything that might hurt the South. Meaning, what will ever pass? No. Nothing. Nothing. all like today. <laughs> Nothing will ever pass. And, needless to say, he it did not pass. And, I'm sad to say it, everybody. That is his grave in Charleston. And I want you to imagine something. You ever have one of those really dark nights? I mean, it's like dark, maybe like stormy. So it gives kind of an eerie feeling. And like you're sound asleep. And suddenly wakes you up. And you feel a presence. And you, you open your eyes. And you see this. Ah! That might be. So the point is you have all these giant, yeah, there's no neck here, they cut it off there. And they would carve the eye, you know, they would shave the eye to give it kind of a, a look. And they did the same thing with the top of his head. But Calhoun died too. You have all these politicians, as awful as Calhoun was, but they still were thinking, how do we save the country? And now we have people who aren't so willing to compromise. What a good place to stop. We're not there yet. And I'm going to wait till you're not here. No, I will tell you. Right. So. Well, actually, for 11, we've already done our quiz on part of chapter 11, so it's just going to be on the outside. Um, no way, you're not again. So I can be done one day. And then, where are you going? <laughs> yeah, you take up the quiz. I gave you the homework. Okay. This is a big one. You're going to do the compromise. Okay. Long. We're going to do camp to the brow It's a big one. Okay. You know, that's right. Um, I'm also going to be gone. Just, I know. After all I've done, guys. Yeah, I'm just sorry. Remind. I gave yeah. you a so the case. Good I'm point. You're, you're good people. It's on the DBQ. So let these just go. Okay. Yeah. yeah. For which one you think would be best? You would use, you know, the the evidence or the purpose of the of the art of the doctor. Yeah. So the doctor best answer to the question. Okay. And then what is it? Uh, how can we start with them? Uh, Still three. 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 You missed all that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, we turned it. I assigned you were here when I assigned it. Yeah, dude, we start with the first one. No, I let him last. You had just missed it. It's like, no, it's chill. So you have to do that. You have to do this. historical content. First one, so one. one. For the first one, and then the last one. So for that one, and Uncle Tom's Cabin. Purchase me from Mr. Rosca. Yes. So okay, I'll be right back. Two or three sentences. Yeah, so a historical uh, content, you're just making like a short range short list of five points. Right. And then for purpose, give me, a, give me a couple sentences, explain the purpose, and a couple sentences, explain what the author, you know, what about the author made him have the right this? That's the point of view. 